morning, everyone, and welcome to the regular school committee meeting of the PV School Committee. Tonight is December 22nd, and our meeting is beginning at 7.05. Uh, this meeting is being held in the library at Higgins Middle School. We have school committee members, the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, our business manager, and uh, other administrators as requested by the superintendent. In accordance with the governor's order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, the regular meeting will not allow in-person attendance to members of the public. But every effort is being made for the public to adequately access the meeting in real time via techno technological means. Alternative public access to this meeting will be provided in the following manner. This meeting is being televised by PV Access TV. In real time, public participation can be addressed to the PV School Committee utilizing the Zoom virtual meeting software for remote access. The address and the call in number are available on screen, and during public participation, we'll, we will be taking calls from members of the public. So, this evening, if you'll join me, we're going to begin the meeting with a moment of silence, and then we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, I'm Beverly Griffin Dunn. I'm the vice chair of the school committee, and I'm running this evening's meeting. Mayor Betancourt could not be with us. But we hope he's watching. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to do, because this is um, a basically a remote meeting for members of the public, we are going to take uh, the roll call at this time, just so that everyone knows who's here. So Dr. Lord, would you like to do the honors? Commissioner Miko? Present. Commissioner Arnotis? Present. 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 Thank you. And we're joined by Dr. Josh Vidala and Dr. Chris Lord as well as Mr. Scanlon, our business manager. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on, we have the minutes from the December 8th regular school committee meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the December 8th school committee meeting. Okay, motion made by Mr. Arnotis. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Olympio. Is there any discussion, any corrections? Seeing none, roll call vote. Yes. Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Olympio? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, approval of bills. Mrs. Carpenter? Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve warrant number 4662 in the amount of $34,945.73 dated December 22nd, 2020, subject to audit. Second. Okay. Motion made by Mrs. Carpenter. Second by Mr. Olympio. Any discussion? Being none, roll call. Mr. Amico? Yes. Mr. Arnotis? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Olympio? Yes. Ms. Dunn? I'd like to make a motion to approve warrant 4663 in the amount of $1,186,932.29 dated December 22nd, 2020, subject to audit. Second. Okay, motion made by Mrs. Carpenter, second by Mr. Olympio. This is warrant B. Any discussion? Being none, roll call vote. Mr. Amico? Yes. Mr. Arnotis? Yes. Mr. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Olympio? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on, continuing business, uh, the Welch School MSBA project update. I, I can assure all the members that there is a lot of work going on right now with the Welch School project. Our uh, PDP was submitted early, and MSBA has been reviewing it. They requested just a couple of additional pieces of information that are just very minor, and um, that is working its way through the MSBA, and they will be approved. Well, they will be voting on it in <laughs> February, and we're hoping they will be approving it. And um, so we will have a regular scheduled Welch School building 
uh, building committee meeting in January. I'd also just like to let you know with an MSBA project that um, last Wednesday, Dr. Vidala and I uh, attended a, an online meeting with MSBA. And Dr. Vidala, you want to make that announcement? About what we were watching last Wednesday, West the West Memorial. Yes, it's good Our news. On the uh, superintendent's report, we'll, we'll move it right oh, up. I'm I sorry, there it is. To announce that the MSBA has invited the West Memorial Elementary School into the Accelerated oh. Repair Program for a uh, for a new roof over the gymnasium. So we're very excited about that. We will bring this to the okay. school committee in okay. January for oh, a vote, okay. and then there will be a vote okay. on that. Okay. No vote tonight. It's just a very happy announcement. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Vidal. I should have jumped ahead and <laughs> you had it right there. There we go. <laughs> it was good news. We wanted to get it out there quick. Okay. Um, moving you. along, we're going to go into the superintendent's the report. <laughs> There's your cohort. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Superintendent Vidala, for inviting me to come and talk about the wonderful things that are going on with CTE. Um, did you know that Peabody Veterans Memorial High School is only one of 31 comprehensive high schools in the state that offer CTE programs? So what that means is that uh, Boston, for example, has many, many programs, probably close to 25. Peabody has six. Um, so the six programs that Peabody Veterans Memorial offers um, is culinary arts, cosmetology, criminal justice protective services, early childhood education, electronic tech, uh, engineering, and medical assisting. Um, I would like to also let you know that over 300 students are considered CTE majors in grades 10, 11, and 12. And in addition, we have about 130 students that are exploratory students as freshmen. Um, this year, we were uh, the recipient of a capital skills grant that was uh, given through the Executive Office of Education, basically Governor Baker's office, and it was in the amount of $200,000. That award was given to programs that are of excellence, that have rigor in their curriculum, and that are doing outstanding work with industries partnering around topics of certifications and licenses. It's important to note that Peabody was the recipient of such a large grant, so the message that I get from the Executive Office of Education, that we must be doing something well. Um, in addition to that grant, we received um, a smaller grant for, uh, it's called the vacation after um, vac summer vacation grant, and that's given by DESE, and that is also geared towards CTE students using um, after school time or summer vacation time or possibly school vacation time to earn credits towards their much needed certifications and able to sit for exams for these certifications they, many require that students put in certain amount of hours um, in front of their teacher live so that they can sign off on competency. So it's very important students get to have some work in front of the teachers during the, during the school year. Um, I also will tell you that, let me use my glasses here. Uh, of the grant that we received for the 200,000, um, $100,000 was given to the culinary arts program where we decided um, the kitchen, the melting pot kitchen, was in much need of re updated repair for the refrigerators, the stoves, and some of the heavy duty equipment that they use, the large industrial mixers. Some of this equipment is from the original building. So you can imagine that um, meeting safety requirements as a first and foremost, we needed to replace all of that equipment. The other part, uh, the other $100,000 was used for the electronics engineering program. And I'll be speaking about that more in a bit. Um, just want to go over some of the highlights of each program for culinary arts. Um, the culinary arts program um, has been uh, meeting with the health and city, city health inspector who basically walked us through safe protocols for handling food. And so we are now doing Friday grab and goes where teachers get to purchase lunches on Fridays or dinners on Fridays. We offer coffee in the morning to staff 
and we just had a, a holiday cookie um, uh, uh, presentation. So we're trying to get A, students back into the kitchen and back creating a, uh, an atmosphere of back to normalcy as much as possible. In cosmetology, the students in that program are really, really investing a lot of time outside of class, again, working towards their license. They're very, very serious about getting ready for the spring when they take their Massachusetts cosmetology license. In order to take that license, they have to accomplish a certain set of hours, and they have to be able to perform skills in order to get their license. And cosmetology is very serious about not only getting their license, but in the year past, these students purchased their own, with their own money, um, a, cer a certification class so that they, each student paid $250 out of their own pocket so that they could get a certification in an area of cosmetology. So what I'm saying to that is, when I first started in Peabody over 20 years ago, the vocational technical student that I'm seeing now is much different. They're serious about their career, they're investing in their own career. I don't know many professionals that take time over and above their job and put their own money into it. So I think the philosophy I see students taking is I'm investing in myself. The money that I'm spending is for myself and my future. And that's really something pretty amazing. I've also been told by the cosmetology teachers and by my own hairdresser that the more skills you have, the more unique skills and certifications, the more money you'll make. So these are all good things for our cosmetology program. Um, our new criminal justice protective services program received our letter of approval in November. That program is just hired a, uh, a new teacher for that program. She, is, um, com she comes from the Boston court system and has a lot of experience dealing with the probation department and um, brings a wealth of experience to the students. So we're very excited to have her. And in addition, there are, I can't even tell you how many people from the community, the Peabody courts, the Peabody Police Department, the Fire Department, Cataldo Ambulance, all willing to help in any way they can and willing to be uh, virtual guest speakers, uh, virtual tours, and can't wait till students be able to see them in person and work with them directly. Um, our electronics engineering, we've, des we've taken that money, the $100,000 I mentioned earlier, and we've designed, redesigned the program in a scaffold approach, meaning that freshmen and sophomores would be studying electronics as well as robotics, and upperclassmen will start drone technology and fiber optics so that students in their senior year will literally be walking across the stage with a diploma in one hand and it'll be an electronics technician, certified technician in the other. So they'll have that, cert that certification. We have um, partnered with RCN. Uh, we have been meeting with their vice president, their general manager of the Northeast, their chief engineer, chief cook and bottle washer. Everybody at RCN is basically wants to meet with us and they are very interested in what we're doing with our program. Um, they want to help, they want to support what we're doing, they are very impressed with the direction that we're going, and uh, <clears throat> they, they really want to work with us. So we're very excited about that partnership with them. Um, our early childhood program recently formed a partnership on, um, with uh, Cambridge College, where they're offering our students 15 credits, guaranteed admission to the program, to the Cambridge College. Um, in addition, students that are in the early childhood program are able to take courses at $200 per course. So that again, a student in early childhood could, could be walking across the stage with a high school certificate as well as maybe a first year of Cambridge College under their belt. So we're very excited that they couldn't be any more gracious as far as working with us as, um, as partners in this endeavor. So we're very excited about that dual enrollment co uh, concept of students taking college courses while in high school. In our last program, Medical Assisting, we are, um, we are continuing to work. Again, these students are similar to Cosmo and the other programs. Students are coming in at all hours that they can, ready to work, trying to get their hours under their belt so that they can work towards their, their exam that they take in the spring. Um, the students sit for the American Medical Technologist exam, and they get a certificate as a reg registered medical assistant. What that means is they can walk out the door after high school and the next day start working as a full-time medical assistant. And the jobs that I'm talking about, or the careers rather, that I'm talking about are unlike 20 years ago where students basically floated around and tried to find a job. These students are walking into good paying jobs, jobs where they can support themselves, they can get an apartment, they can have a car. These are the kinds of jobs that we want for PBD students. And so um, we're very pleased about that. 
The other thing is that when we first started taking that exam um, over three years ago, we were the only high school in the entire country that was doing this exam because of the rigor. Usually that's done at the college, post-secondary, community college level, or even four-year college level. They were very impressed that a high school was trying to accomplish this. And so now there are three high schools in the country, but Peabody was the first. Um, the other thing is we're planning in February to do some externships with our program. Actually, all of our programs, we would like to start trying to do some things this spring. We don't know what the, what the situation's gonna be like, but I know that Leahy has been in conversation and we are entering a new partnership with uh, Leahy Health and Beverly. Um, so we will have increased pl placements for our students in February um, if, if the situation allows us to place students. And if not, we'll be hopefully crossing our fingers and doing it in the late spring. But our plan is to have externships for our students as soon as we can. And we're working on building those relationships and making them happen. And going back to Superintendent Vidal's point about our eighth grade and our videos, yes, this year we were unable to go down to the eighth grade like we usually do. Usually we do a full presentation, we do a career fair, we visit them several times. So we had to do it virtually. And so what we decided was all of our students, who better to promote the program than the CTE students? They don't want to hear from me because I'm old. They want to hear from the high school students. So we had the students do the presentation, make a video, wrote the video, Crossing our fingers, everything went well. And, um, and then we show the videos to the eighth grade. Every eighth grade in Peabody, eighth grader at the Higgins has seen this video and seen the slideshow. We did Google Meets last week and ended today. Now my plan is that after the school vacation, we'll be showing, inviting the parents and the guardians to see the, the, the video and the slideshow and meet with me, myself, and some of my CT staff as well. So that's our plan, not just reaching the students, but also having conversations with the parents and a guardian, so because that's an important point. Um, and the video slideshow will be featured on the Higgins website, and it will be on the PBMS we website, and Jim Palmer was gracious to let me send it to him as well. So that's where we're at on December the 22nd, 2020. I look forward to the coming months. Um, I think we've, we've done pretty well so far, and uh, I, I couldn't be prouder of the staff and students and their accomplishments, and I look forward to the uh, months ahead. Okay. Any questions from the committee? Did, any questions from the committee? Um, actually, yes, Mr. Amico. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Ferry, thank you so much for um, your 20 years plus here in Peabody, uh, for advocating for students, especially uh, in CTE. Um, it's such a valuable program. Um, these kids, as you said, are job ready, are career ready. Uh, they get that, that cert and they get a uh, high school diploma it's just so important and I just want to commend you and thank you and thank you. please reach out to us if you need anything whatsoever Peabody is a great community and um, through partnerships I'm sure we can uh, we can help out in any way but thank you. just thank you so much for all you do and I know your, your students are very thankful thank you Mr. I notice thank you thank you for being here Mrs. Ferry and that fantastic presentation you know I hope people are watching tonight because when I talk about the value that we have here in the Peabody Public Schools what we offer compared to everyone else you just hit the nail on the head and laid it out uh, very clearly for folks so I, I you know I hope that's understood that it really is a needle in the haystack situation with what we offer when it comes to CTE and workforce development you know I always say I challenge anyone to find whether it's a public school or private school who is going to get our students ready to go out into the workforce. And you know, just some, you know, an electronic uh, technician certification, uh, medical assisting, I mean, these are the jobs of the future. These are careers, you know, it's not part-time. These are real futures for our students that have been developed in the PB public schools, and you are not gonna find that in very many other places. So, you know, I hope people notice that and take advantage of it, and it sounds like they are. I think you said over 300 uh, students are active in those areas, so, uh, you know, I'm thrilled that this program is uh, going as well as it is, and I hope it continues, and I hope we can expand it even further. Um, you know, I, I do think there's a bright future ahead, and I think that balance of a strong academic offering along with CTE and workforce development is going to allow PBD public schools to present and offer the best of both worlds when it comes to wherever our students want to go after they leave us. So thank you so much uh, for the work you do there and let's keep it going. Thank you. Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you for the chair. Mrs. Ferry, it's so nice to see you. Um, we don't, 
I say this all the time when we have a guest. I'm like, we don't see a lot of people anymore, but <laughs> it, it, it is really nice to see you. And, and I appreciate the updates you gave us. Um, you know, I'm a product of a vocational school. I, I, I know the value of it. It is tremendous. Um, the trades that, that some kids leave without spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in college is, I mean, it's just outstanding. Um, I was just listening and I was just thinking about some of the, the um, vocational offerings that we have and, and given our current situation. And, and I just have a question. I'm just concerned and I'm wondering if you need anything from us. I know some of these trades, some of these vocations require hands-on, in-person hours. Are we okay? Are those kids going to be okay and get the hours and the hands-on experience that they need to move forward in their trade? Well, I can say Mr. Magno's been pretty, pretty terrific about um, having conversations around that he's very supportive. And um, I think he's, he and we will do what we can in terms of doing it safely and doing it under the constraints of when the building is open and, and we're allowed to be in, in the building. Um, but I, I, I can't say he's been, he's been very good about um, trying to, he understands our needs and uh, will try to accommodate the hours that students need as we move forward. So I think that's the best that we can do. And um, I think that at some point, DESE and the state have to understand um, they can't shortchange students and penalize them for things that they, they can't, they're trying the best that they can. So I think my theory is I think DESE will take a breath um, when this is later in the year and say, you know, for some schools you were unable to do this and we should take another, we should appeal it or take another look at this. I think that, you know, students need their licenses and they need their certifications. Um, but I think we're in a good place right now. I, I am hopeful. Um, and uh, we're hoping that February vacation or if not April vacation, the teachers have some pretty creative ideas about what to do. Again, um, the, the kudos to the staff for, for thinking out of the box and coming up with some good ideas. And I think we're gonna do what we, what we are able to do safely. Okay. So I would just say um, to you, Ms. Ferry, and to you, Dr. Vidala, if we look like we're coming into a situation where some of our students are not going to be able to meet the requirements because of, um, you know, remote working remotely, some of these trades require hands-on hours. Um, I would just ask both of you if you could please let us know if there's something we can do to ensure that everyone is able to, you know, for our seniors is able to accomplish and and take their, their state mm -hmm. boards or mm -hmm. get their certificates mm -hmm. and if we can somehow work with whoever we have to work with to make sure we get them in for their hands-on experiences, I would ask Absolutely. both of you please to come, come to this board and, and whatever motions or negotiations or anything that we have to do to make sure these students are successful, I really want to make sure that we do that because that's very important. That the vocational students work twice as hard with the, the, the trade they're working on and their academics and then to not be able to fulfill that piece that they've been working on for so long, mm -hmm. I, I would hate for that to happen. Right, right. So. And I definitely will follow up. Thank you so Please, much for the yes, offer. Yes, and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Very good point, Mrs. Scott. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mrs. Ferry, it's always wonderful seeing you. Uh, I think this is your third go around with Peabody yeah. and it's always great to see you here. And whenever you come here, you brighten up the room and, and you bring wonderful news. We typically don't meet, uh, or ha we, we typically don't have a second meeting in December, but if we're gonna get new rooms uh, at the West Memorial School and hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, grant money to improve CTE programs, I'm willing to meet the second <laughs> meeting every December. <laughs> um, no, seriously though. Uh, thank you for, I'm sure you had a, a, a large part in finding uh, that money yeah. and, and it is needed. I, I'll say I wrote the grant along with Ms. Spinoza and we, we basically, it was a challenge writing this grant because of the large amount of money, um, but it's off my bucket list. It was one of the things I always wanted to do and it was basically for the kids. It's a good thing, so it's time well spent. Absolutely, and when you retire again from yeah. the being the director of CTE, maybe we can <laughs> no. bring you back as a grant writer. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you very much for all that you do for the program. Thank you for all that you do for uh, the high school and, and PBD public schools in general. You. Your passion for students and education uh, is something that you've exhibited the entire time I've known you. So please continue that. 
and almost as important as all of the other things I just said. Uh, we have a few big weeks coming up, uh, so roll tide. I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Roll Tide. Roll Tide, oh my God, that's a private joke. My, my husband's a big Alabama fan, so. <laughs> we, have a, we have a Christmas tree in Alabama, Christmas tree, Alabama lights, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Olympia? Yes, the, echo everything that my Thank colleagues you. have said. Thank you so much for all that you do for this program, and it's really something that I'm proud of, that we have this type of uh, program in Peabody as the costs of college really become impractical in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. that this gives you know, students an opportunity to really to, to be licensed, to have a fantastic career, and really mm -hmm. pave their own path, mm -hmm. um, whereas they stare at a couple hundred thousand in student debt, that could be very discouraging, and this is just a nice, uh, really alternative if they choose to do that, and it's something that I know I'm proud of and that we're all proud of, so thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Ferry, you know <laughs> that the CTE programs are near and dear to my heart, I and do. I'm thrilled to hear about basically the expansion. Mm -hmm. That is really, really encouraging because we know there are so many kids that are looking for this training and for this mm -hmm. career track and to try to be able to accommodate them all has been y your goal, and I'm, I'm just really, really excited to hear Thank about you. the engineering, the change there. I think that's a beautiful change. Mm -hmm. And knowing that when the kids graduate, mm -hmm. our students are workforce ready. Mm -hmm. Getting those certificates is huge. Mm -hmm. That yeah. really, that's very, just wonderful. I you always say my, so my favorite word is options, and that's because I love the notion of students being able to pick and choose which direction they want to go in. So if they have options, they can choose to work. Yeah. I want to go to a two-year college. I want to go to a four-year college. I want to work and go to college. So it's the beauty of that word, really, that capitalizes how I feel about giving that to, to Peabody students, that they can choose. They're not pushed in, in any one direction. Many of our students do go on to college, um, a, high, a high number actually do go on to college from our CTE programs, but I always like students being able to have that breath and make choices in life rather than be pigeonholed into one area. Mm -hmm. Now the dual enrollment, that's a wonderful benefit and I'm really glad, I'll, I'll be honest, I hesitated at the beginning when, when Dr. Vidal said, gave me the high sign about questions because I thought we were going to show the, um, the video that you prepared. So I was all set to you know, watch the video. There are so many people, and I'm, I'm thrilled that PATV is going to carry it too. So many people in Peabody have no idea about the offerings at the high school. Mm -hmm. And our CTE program is really a hidden gem up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more people that know about it, the more people are going to be extremely surprised mm -hmm. and very pleased with what our high school does do for the students in Peabody. And um, I'm, I'm really, really glad that you went ahead with your plan for the, uh, the virtual open house. Yes. Or, you know, and I think that that's going to give a lot more people um, a lot more pride in our school because I am, I am always amazed at the number of people who have no idea right. about the programs we offer up there. It, it just it really just shocks me because I guess we've known about it for so long we kind of just assume everyone knew. Right. Then they really don't. It, it, it's true. It's, it's good. I'm, I'm really glad that the word is getting out there that you have such a good program. Thank you. And I know the rates, the passage rates for our students when yes. they go for their licenses, sometimes it's a 100% pass rate. That's huge. It's huge. That yeah. really is. There's one thing I do want to ask you. I couldn't catch it. The masks. This drives yeah. me crazy. What is the exam that Peabody was the only one that took? You said that we were only the the first one in the country that took that. Th as that a was the medical, the medical, uh, the medical exam. Okay. I, I can tell. It's called the they sit for the American Medical Technologist exam, mm -hmm. and they walk away with a registered medical assistant cer certification, and that you can walk into any doctor's office right. anywhere, mm -hmm. and and get hired on the spot with that with that certification. Mm -hmm. 
I knew our medical assistance program was mm -hmm. really special. Um, that that's another feather in their cap. I didn't realize that we were the only ones doing that. Yeah. And I know that the students, well, they've gone on to paying jobs. They've gone into college. Some of them are planning medical school, and I have no doubt that they're going to go. Right. And, and, uh, and the fiber optics technician, I don't think there are many schools offering that no, uh, certificate either. And it just was coincidental that RCN is in Peabody, and I thought, okay, I've got to put those two together mm -hmm. and have that conversation because that's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And like I said, when we had the conversation on a Google Meet with the vice president and the powers that be at RCN, they, they were like, um, we definitely want to be part of what you're doing, and, and they have all, they've come up with uh, all kinds of plans. So I'm very excited about what the possibilities are with them. That's great. Yeah, that it really is. Yeah, right place at the right time. Yep. Okay. Are there any further questions or comments? No. Dr. Lori. Maria. Hi. You rock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lori. I think we all agree yeah. with Thank you, Dr. Lori. Wow. Absolutely. It's the best Christmas present ever. <laughs> Oh, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you so really, much. This was thank great. you, everybody. Thank you. Pleasure seeing everyone. Thank great. Thank you, Maria. We, we continue to be impressed at the work that is done with our CTE students and those presentations. And we'll put the videos online as well so that people can see them because I think it's, it's really a, a credit to you and to the program. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. I appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Great. And so the next item on the superintendent's report is an overview of the FY21 budget. So I am going to display this on the screen. In the committee, you also have a, a copy of this. So this is a high-level overview of where we are about halfway through the, the school year. And these are the DESI codes. And so the first column all the way on the left shows the DESI codes for each area of the budget. And each one of these areas, so the 1000 series, for example, is general admis administration. And this can be broken down into a number of accounts. And the general administration, what you'll see is this is typically the superintendent's office and uh, our clerical staff and whatnot. And these are people who work 12 months a year. So at this point, we should see about 50% spent. And so the far right column, you see we're at about 47%. Uh, so we're right on track. The 2000 series is, is instruction. And so it, it includes our teachers and you'll see that uh, Teachers are 10-month employees, and so the payroll gets start, starts getting distributed in September, and it goes through the year. And, and so at, on 10 months, we'd see about a third to 40% during this time. And so you'll see uh, that we're just under a third here at 32%. Uh, our substitutes are a little bit lower at 26.8%. We have seen that we uh, are struggling, and everyone is struggling right now, to uh, fill the number of subs uh, that is required, we're having difficulty filling the number of subs, so we're at about 26% uh, of that budgeted item. Uh, where that could go up is included in that would be long-term maternity subs or if someone needed to take a leave or things like that. So it is good to make sure that we are under that budget uh, as we may need more uh, funding in that area. So I think that we're, we're well budgeted this year in that area. Uh, you'll see that the paras are at about 40%. Our general instructional supplies, we usually buy things uh, at the beginning of the year, so that's why that's above 50%. And uh, for our psychologists, we're right at about 33%. Um, the 3000 series is around, so our attendance office, uh, that's with our data, they're 12-month employees as well, um, so you'll see that in the 40 to 50 range, so we're right on track there. Transportation's coming in at 60% right now, and what that is is that is our regular transportation we're seeing, um, and there is money in there that's also built in for field trips and late buses and things like that. Um, so there, there may be a, a little bit in there that we may not quite get to the top, but one thing that we're uh, a little bit concerned about and making sure that we monitor this closely is that the revenue coming in that we had for to offset that account is gonna be different than it was last year. The bus fee that we charged was only $100 this year versus a, a larger number and less kids are taking the bus. Um, so that is something that we'll continue to monitor and, and, and report out on. Um, below that you see athletics, and so athletics is at 24%, and remember that we're, we're doing four seasons this year, so we're about a quarter of the way through, and we're planning to have three more seasons, so uh, we seem to be right on track there, but we are making sure that we monitor that, understanding that with less games there may be less officials and, and whatnot, so we're making sure that we're keeping good track of our athletics. Uh, the student activities, you'll see this number is very low right now. We had a late start to 
um, our extracurriculars, which we reported on at the last school committee meeting, but they have gone underway. The stipends just haven't been paid out yet, and so you'll see those that uh, money will be encumbered as we go, and we're really looking to try to increase that as we get in. So, uh, you know, that's that's not a major concern for us right now. Uh, that that's that low because we do expect to be paying that. Our school security is right at about a third. Um, you get into the, the 4,000 series, this is around operations. And so this money is encumbered all at once. So that's for our, our heating and our utilities. And so it was a little bit above uh, what was originally budgeted, but we don't expect to see that to, to go up any further. It's based on the rates that, that we're working on with, with City Hall. So um, just a little bit over the budgeted amount. In the 5,000 series, you'll see insurances. And, and so one thing that jumps right out at us is this number of 190%. So that's employee severance. And, after the budget was set, we did uh, work out a, a, an agreement for an early retirement incentive. So you will see that that number uh, is higher than what was budgeted, but the savings that will be realized may be in the salary account. And so we'll be able to, uh, to, to make sure that, that we come in under budget overall. Uh, health insurance is budgeted, uh, which I know that was a, a big issue last year, so we made sure that we budgeted that. Um, we encumbered the whole thing up front, so we're right at about 100% there. And the same thing with employee insurances uh, and, the, and the lease fees. And then the last line in this item is crossing guards, which were about 25%, uh, and we're expecting uh, they're working 80 to 85% of the days this year. Um, so we are keeping our eye on that. And then the 9,000 series overall is our special ed tuition. And so uh, we encumber the money up front. We do have a little bit of a buffer here, which we like to add in case there are new kids that need uh, a, a specialized placement or a student who moves into the city. We want to make sure that uh, that doesn't disrupt the budget. Um, so overall, the uh, appropriated budget here at the very bottom of $74,854,358 that was voted on in uh, June. We've spent thir about 37.9 million. So halfway through the year, we're right at about 50.7%. Feel like we're in a pretty good place. Uh, there are definitely some areas that we're drilling down and, and looking on. Uh, but this is a nice high level way to look at the budget halfway through the year. I'd like to continue to come and, and bring this type of report. And then if there's any questions, we can drill into them a little bit further and bring back more information. So it's just a high level overview of where we are halfway through the year. Uh, but this is something that you know, we, we meet almost weekly about and, and discuss. Uh, but I think it's good to bring out, out to uh, the community just, just because this year has been a tough budget year and we want to make sure that uh, you know, we're making sure we spend our money appropriately. Uh, I know I came to the, the committee over the summer about a couple, uh, we had that severance and we realized some money early on and there were some positions that we wanted to really make sure we got in there, that social worker at the high school, one at the middle school, uh, a fourth grade teacher at one of the schools, and we wanted to make sure that we could do that to open, um, and that's all within this budget. And so we're still coming in right where we should be, and we haven't come back to, to make any changes to the appropriation. Um, as we get closer to the end, if there's anything that we need to uh, adjust, or if there's an area we're looking to go over, or there's an area that, that we're underfunding, we'll come back to the committee and, and, and have a discussion about how to appropriate that money. So I'm happy to field any questions. We also have Mr. Scanlon here as well. Okay, any questions? Mr. Hockey? Thank you. Um, through the chair to either Mr. Scanlon or Dr. Vidala or Dr. Lord, I don't wanna leave you out. Uh, with regard to the transportation services, uh, I see that we're over a little bit and I understand that the offset or what we're not, we're not calling it an offset anymore, but the, in, the revenue stream is gonna be lighter um, than we, I think, budgeted for. Who, who is providing the um, PPE for um, our, the bus company, Healy? Uh, the bus company, yeah, they're paying for it. They're and do we get billed for that? Yeah. Okay. They clean their own buses. They provide their own PPE. We own buses, so right. we provide right. our PPE for our buses. Right. Okay. And with regard to line or, or Desi Code 5350, the lease rental, what is it that we're leasing at this point? Uh, it's the rent at 27 Lowell Street. That's primarily, it's 100000 a year. That's the majority, of, uh, well, not 100000 90000 a year. That's yeah. basically what that is. Okay, that's what I thought. So um, I think when we had the administration move into 27 Lowell Street, it was on a five-year lease. If my memory's right, we're in the fourth year of that five-year lease. Um, I 
appreciate that we needed to move out of the Kiley, have the administration move out of the Kiley. Um, I don't, if I'm still on this board when that lease is up, I don't plan, do not plan on supporting uh, another lease at 27 Lowell Street. I think we have space around the city um, to, to have savings of $97,000 or $90,000, whatever. 90, you know, it's a large number. Uh, so I would ask um, the administration to work perhaps with City Hall and start looking for space because a move of this magnitude doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it's probably going to take several months for just the IT department to get things up and running. And, and frankly, I don't want to hear next um, April or May or May of 22 that uh, we don't have time to move, so we need to renew a lease. So if we can please start that process if it hasn't already begun. Um, and then getting into the, uh, I expect that we're going to see a savings in crossing guards since they're not working, they're an hourly, they're hourly workers and they're not, gonna, not working as many hours. So we may have some um, funds left over in those lines. Uh, with regard to public tuition, uh, DESE code 9100, is that uh, school choice students that choose to uh, go uh, to school outside of Peabody? Those are special education. It's a special education public day school. Okay, so placements. It, so it's placements in public schools other than the consortium. Public day schools, yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it, just lastly, just as uh, maybe this is an aside or or a statement on my part, I do know that there's some um, conversation going on with regard to Peabody's uh, public library and its uh, budget, uh, which is a city budget. It's not part of our budget. I, I understand that. The library historically is very, very supportive of the public school department, and we all, um, I think, can agree on the value of uh, the accreditation of the public library um, for our school system and our students. Uh, if at some point during the course of working through this budget, if we do see uh, lines running over like that crossing guard line or perhaps other lines, uh, I, I would, for one, be in favor of entertaining a conversation with uh, the mayor's office and the library trustees to see if we could somehow assist them um, with, with some funds, whether it be to return some money to the city and let the city allocate it. I don't know the procedure or the process for that, but uh, this seems to be, and I hope it is, a one-time issue. And if we have the ability to assist in that in any way, I think it's not only worthwhile, but perhaps even incumbent upon us uh, with all of the help and uh, support that we've received from the library over the years. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? I, I actually have a couple of questions. Sure. Dr. Abdallah, with this overview, my question is, recently the city council gave us a supplemental budget. Where does that fall in here and what, what brought that about? Uh, was this the vote that uh, to close out FY20 to fix the deficit in FY20? So think. that that was that the FY20 budget ended up in a in a deficit due to uh, the way that the health insurance was budgeted, mm -hmm. and so that was just to pay off the FY20. Uh, that was that oh. was that. It, Mr. Scan, am I saying that right? Um, it was just to to close out FY20 and to get that to zero. Oh, that okay. that that's what uh, that vote was for. Thank you. Okay. All yeah, right. we are not projecting. We're not going to request of the city an additional appropriation for this year. So okay. we'll make this budget. We'll bring it in mm -hmm. on its target. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, right now we're okay with the school budget. Yes. Presently. Yes. We we are we are not anticipating having to go back to the city council for uh, another appropriation. You know, understanding that this is tight budget years, we're all tightening our belt and making sure that we do what we need to do appropriately within the funds that we were committed. Okay. All right. Thank you. And just to follow up on, on, on what uh, Mr. Hawkman had brought up, it, it is very concerning to hear about the potential of our public library losing accreditation because of the funding. They have to hit a certain funding level. And um, they really are an important partner for the, for the schools. And uh, I know it's something within the purview of the city council, but I too would like to see, you know, they have to protect that. That, in, in regular times, the library is critical to the city, 
but right now the services of the library, the online services that they provide, the um, just the existence of that library is critical to a lot of people. For a lot of our students, it's critical too because of the, um, the use that they make of the library and of the, um, the internet capabilities. And I know it's different right now because the libraries are closed, but still I think to make sure that they maintain their accreditation uh, is really important. I I'd like to see if, um, I don't know if, if a letter from the school committee would, would help or if, if anyone has an idea of how we could advocate for the library, but this did happen once in the past and it was a very serious situation. It prevents the library from borrowing from other libraries. They're all interrelated in, in the state and um, it, it impacts on their ability to, to perform the service that they do, but it also impacts on our students as well. And hopefully, you know, the, the restrictions and the pandemic will end sooner rather than later. When it ends and things really open up, the library's gonna be in demand by the students of our public schools and the private schools, but you know, the public schools, so, um, if, if everybody would like to, I think we should find a way to somehow help to advocate for that because it, it's too important to lose. And I'll be honest, I don't know what we can do as a body other than to write a letter. And I don't know what effect that would have. I don't know what stage it's at, but um, it, it really does sound very critical. Okay, is there any other comments? Or Ms. Carpenter. Oh, Mrs. Carpenter, I'm sorry. That's okay, thank you. So, um, of course, I'm definitely in favor of our libraries and in, in sending a letter of support. Um, I'm just curious because um, I, I don't know. What, what kind of money are we talking here? I don't know. I really Does anybody don't know. know the figure that, that is being sought? Mr. Know. Hockman, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Do you know? I, I do not know the dollar figure, but I believe that their budget um, was only funded at 83%. So I think it was 17% of their budget that was cut. I don't know what their budget is, but I suspect that there might be some library staffers or maybe library trustees that are listening to us right now. And since we're talking before public participation, perhaps somebody can call in and give us a little bit of information. Mm -hmm. if, if, if they could, it would be very helpful and we can, we can revisit I'm being this. told right now it's $225,000. 225? I'm being told by several people. <laughs> 225, 225,000, okay. So, so I, I'm definitely in support of our, our libraries and, and showing, sending the, um, I'm not sure if you're proposing a letter to the city council, Mrs. Dunn, you know, I'm in favor of that. I don't know where our particular budget is gonna land at this point. I know. Um, we've, we've never had any extra money, no, so I, I know, that's <laughs> We're down three million, just for the record. Uh, we're, we're down not <laughs> our budget was appropriated three million dollars less than last year less so than last so year, yeah. so we're we're going to be within our budget because that's what we're charged with yeah. but this money is is allocated to, to students and for k-12 dollars i would hate to see uh money being taken away especially mid-year I, I don't know that that we're in any place to do anything like that i'm in full support of the library and i know that this community is unbelievable at how they pull together and i think that we should do everything we can uh i i just you know, I, I don't, we're, we're, in a, we're in a decent place right now. I don't know that we're in any position to return money to the city, oh, no, uh, I, we, you know, at, at, at this point of the year with our budget. No, I, things are too tenuous here. They, they always are, and we wouldn't be able to, but um, Ms. Don Otis. Yes, very quickly. Uh, and I want to thank Mr. Amico for suggesting it. I'm not going to take credit for it. Oh. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, no, what he had suggested was that perhaps we should have, um, through my subcommittee, a meeting with some of the members of the city council, perhaps before we write a letter or anything like that, let's have a conversation with them. You know, we have to look at our numbers. I'm sure they have to look at their own numbers and, you know, perhaps see if there is an avenue down the line where we could be of assistance. But before we send anything or take any formal action, let's just have that conversation and, and see what everything looks like and where the dust kind of settles when we know numbers are a little bit more firm than they are right now. I think that's an excellent solution. Does everyone else agree with that? So we'll, we'll put this topic into Mr. Arnotis's subcommittee and um, 
with a with a uh, and I'll facilitate that with the with the members of uh, the city council subcommittee there Miss Carpenter is on the committee with me so we'll great. get that conversation rolling and um, you know see what we can do great. thank you that that would be good I don't think we need a vote on that no. um, if we do no, no. no. we're just going to put it into your subcommittee Mr. Yeah, I think you, uh, Mr. Arnotis, terrific uh, point. Um, I think it was your idea, even though you're trying to give credit to Mr. Amico. <laughs> Very humble of you. Uh, <laughs> uh, for, uh, the only suggestion I, I could offer is perhaps you would like to invite some library trustees to that meeting. Absolutely. I'm sure they'd have a lot of insight on this. Yeah, I think that would be great. And please express our, our sincere appreciation and, and strong support of having an accredited library. It, it really is important. Great. Okay. And Doc, I didn't mean to hijack your budget uh, <laughs> presentation. I know. <laughs> That'll always happen. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So the next item on the uh, superintendent's agenda is a discussion on snow days. Uh, as, as you know, we had an historic storm last week uh, that brought 15 inches to Peabody. Um, the two main reasons that we chose to go remote, and I did share this in a letter to the community, uh, was one, just the loss of instruction that we've seen over the past 10 months and ensuring the continuity of instruction is very important for our students. Uh, and the second reason is really access to mental health. Uh, our, our teachers have a really you know, tremendous relationship with our students as well as our counselors. And you know, having access to their counselors and their mental health during the year uh, is, is really important for our students. So those were the two main areas. And I know that on Thursday, uh, the timing of the storm really put a lot of stress on families. Uh, and I was able to speak with some families. And, and right at the onset, I think people were very stressed out um, during the day and worrying about snow removal and things like that. Uh, but I, I have to give some credit to our teachers and our staff who did a phenomenal job of allowing people time in the morning and then you know really connecting with kids and giving them some time to go outside and some time in the afternoon to regroup. Um, so overall, I did check in with all the principals and they did find it to be a, a positive outcome for our kids and, and for our staff. Um, and I think ov overall, we were in a really good place. Um, it's not the ideal situation. Obviously, in-person learning is, is the most important, uh, which is why we're still committed to our hybrid model. Uh, but I think overall, when we take a step back, um, some of the parents who had reached out to me that expressed some frustration, I had some really good conversations about what their particular situation was, and they you know, were certainly understanding of kids that need um, to connect with their, with their teachers. And so understanding that it's, there's no perfect solution to it, uh, you know, as we make any decision, we have to figure out what's, what really works for our community. And in this case, after talking to the principals and um, you know, in, into the teachers, they felt as though the families, uh, you know, by and large, m the majority of our families benefited from this model this year. Um, so we'll continue to look at it, and anybody that, that had an issue that was able to reach out, I really appreciate that. Uh, we did have some great conversations about how we can improve in the future, and we'll continue to take this and, and try to improve our practices as we move forward. Okay. Do you have any questions? Yeah, actually, Dr. Bell, I've got a question. Sure. It, it kind of follows up on the, the snow day and, and, and remote learning and everything. Going forward with rising numbers, there, there is a lot of concern among people about you know, returning to school. And what I'd like to know is, do we have any plans about how, how to deal with the increasing numbers of, of, of COVID uh, positive cases in, in Peabody? And um, you know, what, what we will do upon return from the, the holiday break? Absolutely. So we have entered into some initial discussions uh, you know, with the union. We have not come to an agreement on, on um, not coming back from, from holiday break. And you know, I think what's really important is that what we've hung our hat on the entire year is following the direction of our public health department. And our public health department has said that at this time we have not seen any transmission in the schools and that they support in-person learning and we're committed to that hybrid model. Um, and you know, I think we are going to see a little bit of a sliver of hope. Our numbers um, will see a little bit of a decline this week, so we're on the, the right trajectory. Uh, obviously, with 
the holidays coming up and, and New Year's and, uh, and the Christmas holiday, uh, you know, we are anticipating that families may gather, so we're just hoping that our community, uh, you know, can continue to be safe as, as they have been this past week. Um, I do know that some of the students that we send to the tech, for example, uh, they closed for the two weeks after the, the holiday break for Thanksgiving. They're not, they're not choosing to do that this year. So they, their lessons learned, they're coming back to school on the 4th. So at this time, right now, we're, we're intending to return to our hybrid model on January 4th. Uh, and, and bring our students back. And as our numbers do increase, we find that the schools tend to be some of the safest places in the community because of the mask wearing and the distancing and the, and the cleaning protocols. So at this time, we feel comfortable uh, that our students are safe in school and we're gonna continue with the hybrid model at this time. Will there be, um, like the air quality, mm -hmm. what will happen over vacation with the uh, the filters and the testing and all of that, is that gonna take place? So the filters are changed twice a year. Usually they change them in December, so I can follow up with facilities and ensure that that's happening this, this December break as, as it always does. Um, and so we'll have nice clean filters as, as we return. Uh, and I think you know what we did find when we did our, our in initial study was that our air exchanges were well above the recommended, do uh, recommended amounts in all of our schools. And so uh, you know we've really been doing a great job making sure that all of our uh, all of our facilities are up to date with their filters and that everything is operational. That was one of the things that uh, came up over the summer was people were concerned if, if everything was working, if something breaks, will it be fixed in time? And you know, the, the facilities department has done a wonderful job. So we're, we're really doing a great job. The fact that we've maintained our hybrid model through this entire time and gotten to December and gotten to our <laughs> holiday break uh, without interruption is, is really impressive for, for everyone, for the students, the parents, the teachers, the and all of our people and facilities and all of our staff. Um, so I'm really impressed with what everyone's done and we're gonna continue to be vigilant because we really value the in-person education that our kids can get. Is there a specific point that um, you would be coming to us with concerns about the hybrid model, specifically staffing? I mean, we get a report on who's positive, you know, not who's positive, mm -hmm. but a member of the school community is positive. Mm -hmm. It's impacting staff, it's impacting students, but when it impacts staff, do we have the adequate coverage for our classes when people have to go out on quarantine if they've been exposed, if they're not positive, but they have been exposed? How is that working? Because I know, you know on a good day, it's tough to find substitutes. And I know that people, you know, we, we we hear from, from families who are getting frustrated with the situation about you know, the remote learning, they're frustrated with um, you know, the, 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 the actual coverage of, of teachers in the classroom. Is there a specific number that you will look at or a percentage or anything like that? So I'm in touch with the principals every single day and, and I, we look at the attendance and we make sure that you know, they have the adequate coverage and right now they've had the adequate coverage. I think the, the break is coming at a good time. Give people a chance to, everyone needs a little bit of rest and recovery, uh, both mentally and physically and so this is always coming at a good time. Uh, you know, we've really worked well uh, with, with our teachers and our unions to make sure that uh, we're working collaboratively to meet those needs. I think we always defer to the public health department and say, you know, What's the guidance? We're following the guidance. Is, is this the best thing for our kids and for our staff? And right now, you know, we, we've continued to get the same message of this is what's best for kids. And so I think um, it's not easy, you know, but we, we continue to, to make sure that we do that. Um, our, our principals report to me every single day if, if they have any issues. And, and right now, they're, they're really doing a great job. They're being creative with the coverage. And, um, you know, we, we've been able to maintain that coverage uh, you know, with appropriate numbers, and we'll continue to look at it. So this is something that is, you know, a fluid decision. We'll continue to look at it and bring it to the committee if we think there's a concern. At this time, we don't have the concerns about coming back to school at this, right now. I think it's also heightened interest in it because of, of the governor's announcement today with, you know, rolling things back. And, and it, it, it is frustrating, you know, to see them closing all these different places um, cutting capacities and, and affecting everything except for the schools. That's, 
that's what I think is really, really concerning. And, and it, it is hard to explain to people, you know, no, you can't, you can't go into a restaurant for 90 minutes, but, you know, we can have our schools operating with everybody in the room for six hours. And, and I think well, we're at 50% capacity. Maybe a little bit less, maybe about 40% capacity. So yeah. with the distancing, right, that's why we have our hybrid model. Yeah. Uh, and I do think, you know, I mean, a, a wise member of the legislator one, legislation once said to me, there's only three full service institutions left in our, in, in our country, and, and that's schools, hospitals, and jails. And so where do we want to invest our money? We want to invest our money in schools. I we want to make sure our kids are going there every day because that's where they're getting all the support. We're feeding our kids. We're giving them mental health services. We're really supporting our parents. So you know, I, I, I really think it's, it's important that we do everything we can to outfit our, our teachers and our kids with the right PPE and make sure we do it safely mm -hmm. and just follow the guidance because it's, it's really important that our kids are in as, as Amber and Asia you know, uh, were able to present right. to us you know, um, at the last meeting, it's it's so important that our kids have that connection to an right. adult. You know that that they feel safe with, both physically safe, emotionally safe, and psychologically safe. Yeah. No, it's a huge piece. Yeah, Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you, um, through the chair, of Dr. Vidala. I just want to say thank you. Um, I think you've been doing a really, really good job leading us through the hybrid model. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, when we first made this vote about going hybrid. In the back of my head, I always used to think, oh, let's just make it to Thanksgiving. You know, I really thought we'd be remote by Thanksgiving. And here we are. Um, I consider Thanksgiving more of a, a gathering and travel time than I would Christmas and, and those type of holidays. So I kind of feel like, you know, we're heading in the right direction. Um, I know that Governor Baker just, you know, rolled back a little bit. Um, they specifically said this does not uh, include schools. And, and I'm in agreement with that. You know, I think that we should definitely, that our kids should be in school. It's, it's been proven for the last few months that we are not the spreaders. Um, I feel like we're more of the protectors for those children at this point. So, you know, I just want to say thank you. And uh, Mrs. Dunn had pointed out that we do get some updates about how um, cases are evolving. And could you just explain um, to the public and, and maybe to any staff there at, at home, because um, very, you're very transparent. The process has been very transparent. Could you just explain to the staff um, and parents how that information goes out? Because it is extremely transparent, and I feel like maybe somebody's not seeing it properly. Yes, and it, it is very confusing. We talked about this over, over the summer, and, and thank, thank you for those kind words. I mean, it, it really takes a village. You know, it, it takes a village to, to do this, and, and we have really great people around us. And so uh, what happens often is that a student or a staff member will self-report a positive case, and they may tell the person who they trust the most in the school who's their teacher. And so if a student tests positive for, you know, by household tr transmission, they may contact their teacher and say, I tested positive, what do I do? And our teachers then will relay the information to the public health department. Sometimes that starts a little bit of a rumor around so-and-so tested positive, and the teachers find out about it before uh, the, the message goes out to the community. And when the public health department gets that information, they still need to do all the contact tracing, tracing and that work takes some time. And they've done a really great job, and that's one of the, the bedrock reasons why we have not seen the spread in our schools. So after they complete the contact tracing, then they send the information to me, and then the, the, the principal is able to send out that message, that all call to the community. So when I send the message to the committee, it may be that we've had a handful of cases in our, in our schools. And I'll give that message to, the commu to, to our, sc our school committee and to our, our union, and it may include all of the cases. I take that information and then I go to uh, DESE and I, I provide that information because they have a dashboard. Now I, today, for example, I called DESE and I reported 12 cases. Of the 12 cases in our schools, only six of them were in the schools within the last seven days. So on DESE's report, they're gonna show six cases. But we reported to the school committee, to the union, and to the department, 12 cases. But because they're not in the schools over the last seven days, they're not considered to be you know, a, a danger. There are no close contacts because the person's already been out of quarantine or they might be a remote student or, or staff member. So you know, th that is why it's a little bit confusing because there's multiple numbers, but we always go through the same process. When the public health department does their investigation, they send us all of the information and then we send it out. 
Um, it does take a little bit of time, but it's to make sure that all the information that's going out is accurate. Thank you very much for that. I know there's been some concern about people thinking that they're not getting the information, and I, and I like how you explain, you know, sometimes it gets reported to the person that's closest to that, that child or that individual, so rumors might start. Um, so I just wanna clarify that the union and, our, and the representation, they're notified. All of this to everyone no, is notified. Um, so there's nothing that's being hidden. Um, it's all out there. So I, I appreciate that. And I just want to say on my own, you know, personal, I was talking before about, you know, making it to Thanksgiving and, you know, now here we are at Christmas and we're going to have a little bit of a break and then um, we also have February vacation and then those type of things. I'm still hopeful that we're, we're going back to school. You know, we have a vaccine. We, you're reporting that our numbers are, are lower than they were before. You know, we get through Christmas and we're hitting January, February. You know, I'm hopeful that our kids will be back in school full time. That's my goal. That's where I want to be. I know a lot of people want to be there. We're so successful at this right now. We're doing great. We just keep going. And, and I will tell you, this is something that I'm, I'm definitely planning on talking about in the coming months. Um, you know, Hopefully we just get through our Christmas and everybody uh, does what they have to do, but I think that, that we're doing a great job and, and thank you and thank everyone that's had a part of it. Thanks, Mr. Scott. Mr. Miko. Thank you to the chair. Um, we did start off talking about snow days. I think Mr. Hawkins started this whole thing, so. <laughs> so uh, I, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Vidala for his great work in central office and and all the principals and staff and teachers for all their great work. Um, you know, if, if, I mean, at the beginning of this, I was very uh, against it, but we aren't seeing the, the true spread in our buildings. And, you know, for the restaurants, you know, yes, people have their masks off, they're eating, they're conversing, but, you know, from what I hear in these buildings, these kids are policing themselves. Their masks are on, they're just, you know, they could probably teach the adults how to really do it, you know, the social distancing and, and so forth. But um, the one thing that I really continue to hear about is, is from special ed parents, um, and I know uh, Mr. Olympio is as well. He, he hears a lot through his subcommittee, and, and he's been a great advocate to all the special ed parents, um, and he talks to them all the time. So thank you, Mr. Olympio, for all your work you do there. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Vidal, if there's any way we can reach out, whether it's through public health, to the powers that be at the state to find out when some vaccines would be available for our most vulnerable teachers that do um, have some of these students in their classrooms that, that really need to be in the building five days a week, our, you know, our, our, our severe special needs or some of our autistic kids, the kids who really need to be in the building, is there any way we could offer somehow a way to get these teachers vaccinated and if, if they choose to and, uh, and really start thinking about a plan about getting these kids in five days a week because those are the kids that really, really need to be in buildings. They're, they're, their lives are built on routines and you know, from talking to, to special ed parents, you know, going to school one day, not the next, and I, I think they're in three or four days, uh, but to have that extra day would be so important to those kids and their parents. Um, so if, there's, if that's something we could really look into for the new year, whether it's through help through the state house or through public health to see if there are any vaccines available that we can, uh, and, and you know, we're one of the only districts that have been doing this since, since August. I think we're in week 15. I don't think there's a district our size that has done this. So I would hope that DESE and the state house and everyone else would pitch in and, and really sh know and and really appreciate what Peabody's trying to do here and what we've done from day one. And I, again, I just want to, um, kudos to everyone who's making this happen. Um, this is very special during a, a, a terrible time in our history and uh, I just want to thank everyone for doing that. So if, if, if there's any way you could, you know, let us know in the new year if, uh, if we're seeing any vaccines coming our way, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Miko. And, and I would love to get our special ed populations in five days a week. I know that a lot of parents have come to us and, and they've asked for that. And that is something that you know we would like to do and we continue to have conversations about the logistics and how we can do it because I think it is something that should be a priority. I know that uh, K-12 educators are in phase two, which will start in between February and April. Um, so you know, hopefully 
Peabody would be on the, uh, on the fast track to get some of those earlier vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Nico. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, Mr. Olympia. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Vidal really for your staff and everybody involved in the process. It, it really is, I feel like it is transparent. The principals are calling as well, re relay and really the information that, that you'll give to us ahead of time. So that's greatly appreciated. Um, and thank you, Mr. Meikle, for the kind words. But uh, it is really imperative that uh, special education students, you know, as soon as they can get into uh, a routine five days a week, that would be really wonderful because I mean, I should be part of public participation, but um, really, it's, uh, you know, my son, it's meltdowns, it's, it's really hard on parents, and we like to think that we have a, a structured type of uh, family dynamic, and we're fortunate that we can move some things around and provide maybe additional support on those Wednesdays, but I, I've heard from a lot of special education parents that it's just not going well. It's just, and it's nobody's fault. I mean, it's nobody, the teachers are wonderful, they have wonderful attitudes, they care. I mean, I've heard it, I've witnessed it firsthand, but because of you know the special needs of these children, it just, it really, and it does kinda screw up the rest of the week for these kids. Um, they're not in a set routine. Um, I, I can speak from experience that uh, my son's personality has changed at times and he is going through a, you know, a tough time right now. So, and again, I think we're, able, we're fortunate that we can kind of work with him on our own, that kind of thing, but there are some parents and guardians that don't have that luxury. And it, the remote, I feel like it's, it's not helping the special education children uh, at all, really, in a lot of ways. Um, and again, it's not because of lack of effort. I mean, it's just they need to be in school. And uh, I hope we can get there, like you said. And, and uh, I really, and I feel bad for the teachers because I can, you know, I can, I can see their love, the care, and that they're trying to project over, you know, the Zoom, over the, in, uh, over the computer, and. It's just, uh, for a lot of students, it's just not happening. Um, so I could go on and on about it, but I really, the, I'm hearing it from parents, and um, they need to be in sooner than later. And like Ms. Carpenter said, I, I'm so happy that we're at this point for you know the rest of the students that we're able to uh, be still part of the hybrid model. And yeah, I, I hope that come March, April, that you know we can go back you know more. Um, because, again, there's nothing that replaces in, in person teaching. It really doesn't. And, uh, and again, it's just the circumstance. There's no blame here. I think the teachers and your, and the staff are doing the best they can. And I'm quite pleased with the effort. Um, but again, nothing replaces in person learning. So thank you. Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Well said, well said, Mr. Lapeel. Um, I just want to point out, I didn't start this fire, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> I, I start fires, don't get me wrong, but this one it wasn't me tonight. Um, I, do, I just want to go uh, on record on the subject uh, in the agenda, snow days, and then I'll get to school. Um, and, and I wasn't going to say anything, but we're having a, a kind of a prolonged conversation about school in general. Um, and I wasn't going to say anything because this isn't the year, you know, the MOU that Dr. Dalla worked out with, with uh, uh, the various unions is, is for, I want the public to know, is for this year only. Um, you know, we're, we're in, a, we're in a, uh, a special year, and, and this isn't the year to um, have, have a, I don't think, have a debate about snow days or not having snow days. Um, you know, I'm not in favor of it, and Desi isn't in favor of it in general. This year is just this, a different year, and if we can get it done, um, you know, it, it also provides support, like Mr. Olympio is talking about, uh, and some some structure to students on days when there's inclement weather and we're unable to safely transport kids to school, and it's unsafe for staff to be to, to, to transport themselves to school. So um, 
but in any event, with regard to um, school and our hybrid model, I just want to be clear because there is a lot of conversation going on. There has been a lot of conversation going on. Uh, and, and Doc, you know, you, you really pointed out um, s several key components. Uh, our City of Peabody Health Department is in favor of kids being in school and is in favor of the hybrid model uh, under the circumstances by which we've put forward uh, a plan you know, with mask wearing, with six, foot of social, six feet of social distancing, with hand washing, uh, we provide um, um, uh, hand sanitizer, we provide masks as a school district uh, for staff and students. You know, it, it really is, as I think Ms. Carpenter said, maybe the safest place for some of our staff and students to be. Uh, and, and with, you know, Ms. Car Ms. Dunn mentioned Governor Baker, uh, Governor Baker's announcement today, rolling things back for a two week period, so he says, um, and it didn't include schools, but, you know, DESE hasn't rolled back their position. You know, DESE still uh, is in favor of kids being in school, and I think that they're still in favor of three feet of social distancing, something that we chose not to do for a variety of reasons. We chose to be more prudent than that, uh, and we continue to be more prudent than that. Um, I also don't think the CDC has changed their position on school. I think that they are also in favor of uh, kids remaining in school because we're not seeing transmission in schools. Our uh, health department, our nurse, uh, nursing staff, uh, have, have done an incredible job of tracing um, close contacts for the students that have either self-reported or have tested positive and we became aware of it. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't provide enough accolades to the staff, the custodial staff, the teaching staff, the students, the paraprofessionals, the administrators, and everyone else that has a piece of making this work. Uh, you know, it does take a village, Dr. Vidala, and, and our village is working together. Um, we are being collaborative and getting it done. We all, I believe, received a letter, an email, um, which talked about some issues regarding transparency, and, and Ms. Carpenter raised that. I don't know if it was in response to that correspondence that I think we're gonna receive as a written communication in a few minutes. But um, Doc, I think you've seen it also, and I don't know, uh, I'm happy, I, I was surprised to see it because I know that you've been transparent with regard to um, positive cases. We get uh, calls, unfortunately, too frequently now from not only uh, Dr. Lord and, and all the principals, uh, we get emails from you, um, Dr. Vidal, almost on a daily basis, I think even over the weekends on sometimes. Um, and I assume that, that those calls from the principals are going out to the schools in which those students are identified. And I, I would be shocked if that information was, be, was not being shared with uh, the various unions, the various bargaining units. And tonight you've confirmed that in fact that information is being shared contemporaneously. I mean, when we receive it, they receive it. It's not being delayed, it's not being held back. Uh, I don't know who, uh, who at each of the bargaining units you're communicating with, and I'm not gonna ask you, because I, uh, you, you know who you need to talk to, and that's who you're talking to. And if um, that information isn't flowing through to various members of each bargaining unit, um, you know, while I appreciate receiving the letter, and I'm, and I'm always happy to continue a conversation or engage in a conversation to make sure that everybody's comfortable and feels safe and supported, but perhaps that um, communication should have been directed at the person who, the person or people who are receiving the information in the bargaining units and perhaps not disseminating it to the membership. Um, this isn't the first instance where uh, the membership of various bargaining units doesn't receive information from their leadership, uh, but they vote every uh, so often on that leadership. And if they feel as if they're not being represented, um, that's their recourse, not, you know, I mean, again, I'm happy to engage in conversations to help and support wh whomever I have the ability to uh, as often as I can, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm just happy to hear that the information is being presented to the right people, uh, and um, I, I applaud you and everybody else for keeping this going, and like some other members of this committee, uh, I'm looking forward to full in school, five days a week, in-person school in February, March, April, um, May, and June. Uh, I'm looking forward to athletics resuming 
in their normal uh, fashion. Uh, we're all, we all are. I mean, we're looking forward to a senior luau. We're looking forward to a junior prom. We're looking forward to a senior prom. We're looking forward to a graduation on time uh, in its normal course. Uh, we do need to have hope. We all do need a break. You're absolutely right, Dr. Vidal. We need a mental break and a physical break. But we also need to maintain hope. Uh, we need to remain optimistic and, um, you know, the glass isn't half full or half empty. It's continually being fi filled. That, and that's, uh, I think, the attitude that we need to maintain and, and hold on to. Um, but we're doing a great job. Uh, thanks to all of you guys in the administration, the teachers, the staff, and the students, and the custodians especially, have been doing a fantastic job. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Is there anything further? Mr. Arnotis? Thank you. Through you to the committee, I'm glad we're having this discussion. I, too, am optimistic for the future. I know we talked about it very briefly um, as we were kind of coming in here. You know, teachers are in tier two, as you said, or phase two. Tier phase, you know, it, it, the words are interchangeable at this point. But um, I do think we're going to be looking at, optimistically, a m more normal end of the school year than we may have expected uh, with the timing of vaccines and, and whatnot. I do hope going forward that everyone remains cognizant and smart and safe, um, especially over the holiday season. I think that's a big piece of this. Um, and, I, you know, I want to encourage everyone to, if they can, get tested. You know, I, I think we all have a role in this. As we came here tonight, if you looked in the parking lot, it was filled with cars because people were doing their part in getting tested. And um, I think one of the reasons we have been so successful, and I have no problem saying I didn't think we would have even made it to Thanksgiving. I was clear about that, and I was wrong. And I have no, absolutely no qualms with saying that here. Um, you know, and I'm happy that I was wrong. And I hope I continue to be wrong as we go forward here. We remain open, we remain safe, that there is not transmission in the schools. And I do hope that um, as we round out the holiday season, and you know, I think it's a good thing we're rounding out the holiday season, there's not too many triggering events that have people gather um, after January 1st. But I, I would hope that um, you know, if we stay where we are and, and return on the 4th, which you know, every um, professional in person in the public health uh, zone has suggested that. You know, I do hope people get tested, they stay smart, and um, they do their part to make sure that we can stay open. And when it comes to the dissemination of information, I think you have done a great job at doing that. Um, you know, I, as you said, I think, Mrs. Dunn, you know, rumors do get abound a bit, and I think it's important that we recognize that our staff are the ones in the buildings every day um, doing their part. We are doing more in this district than many other communities are with in-person learning. So, um, you know, I, I certainly don't want to be dismissive of any um, concerns or, or, you know, fears that are expressed to us. But, um, you know, it's important that we continue that transparency. You guys have done a great job doing that, and I am, I am grateful for that. And I hope we can keep that flow of information going. You know, it does get a little... Um, muddled, I think, when just in general, when people have that conversation between you're testing positive or you're quarantining because you may have, you know, been exposed. I mean, it's a, it's a moving target. So we need to be realistic about that, keep that flow of information going, and keep up the good work. Um, you know, our staff and employees have worked incredibly hard to do this, and our students have worked incredibly hard to do this. I'm so happy you said it, uh, Mr. Amico, because it is true. I, I, it seems that uh, young adults, and I, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I especially at the high school, I, I hold off at saying kids because they are young adults. You know, we were just talking about, um, you know, them choosing their CTE and workforce development in their future. They're smart. They're, they're down to earth. They know um, the weight they carry and the responsibility they carry to, for us to stay open and, you know, not have the issues that, you know, some other places have. So kudos to them. Kudos to our staff. And everyone do their part. And we will get through this. I do think, you know, the end of the tunnel is near. So let's keep it going and, and be smart. Thank you all. And Dr. Vidala, thank you. And honestly, the transparency has been extremely beneficial to everyone. And for anyone to say that the numbers, and you know, that, you, that, that there's no transparency is really so wrong. It's confusing. And I think everybody can agree with that. You gave a great explanation of that in response to Mrs. Carpenter's question, and I hope that that helps people understand. 
but people need to know no matter what, if they are upset or confused about something, they can call Dr. Vidalo, they can call the principal, they will get a straight answer. The numbers are coming out, we get those reports every day, the phone calls go out to all the schools, and I don't know what more you could do as far as providing the information to people. So, it's true, thank you very much. Thank you, it's, it's certainly been a, a, a long road for us all and I think that this has really you know, helped bring everyone together in the community. As, as divisive as some of these things can be, I think it's really something that, that unites people. And so, I just wanna end today Yesterday and today, I probably had two of, two of my best days in the district. So I have to tell you, in the spring, when the pandemic first started, uh, Sergeant Jim Harkins started doing parades for kids' birthdays, and the, and the police and the fire got involved, and, and Atlantic Ambulance, and, and you know, people, it gave some joy, and it really gave some joy to some people in the spring. And then they did it for all the schools at the end of the year. They did them with the teachers, and uh, it was really incredible, the work that they did in the spring. And so, about three weeks ago, Sergeant Dave Bonfanti and, and Sergeant Jim Harkins asked me if we could do a parade for the kids this year around the holidays. And so we picked yesterday and today, um, and it just couldn't have worked out any better because the, the weather cooperated for us, and luckily we didn't pick last Thursday and Friday. We picked this Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> and so we went to all the elementary schools yesterday morning, and um, we had Santa Claus and the Grinch, and we had... Um, the, uh, uh, the Peabody BMW company uh, donated, Wah BMW donated uh, a convertible, and so we rode in it, and these guys did an unbelievable job. And you know, I had the ability to, to sit with Sergeant Bonfanti for 90 minutes yesterday and today, and, and you know, we just talking to him, and, and he was saying that this was some of the best days he's had on the force. And, and to me, it was two of the best days I've had as a superintendent, just to see all the smiling faces and really see the joy um, that the kids and the teachers had lining up the streets. And, and really, this, this was how Peabody comes together as a community. We had a fire truck, we had an Atlantic ambulance, we had a cruiser in the front, and then we had the Grinch and we had, and we had Santa. And what was really great is I saw some laptops in teachers' hands with the kids who are remote and they had the kids, and you could see them on the screen because we were pretty close, and they're waving and smiling, and so this was a really good thing. We went, today we went in the afternoon to make sure we got cohort B and the afternoon kindergarten kids, and I gotta tell you, from the pre-K all the way up through grade five, these kids had a great time, and, and it's really thanks to, to Dave Bonfanti and Jim Harkins. They did an unbelievable job, so I just wanted to give them a quick shout out because this, this was how Peabody came together, and uh, it was really a wonderful way to send the kids off and bring some joy to the community. Take these guys off the screen now. <laughs> and that concludes the superintendent's report. <laughs> need to frame that picture. That's a keeper. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Oh, let's see. Next on the Ms. agenda. Oh, oh, Ms. Tawasson. Yeah, through you to Dr. Vidala. Doc, can we, can we uh, send a letter to the Peabody Police Department for their support of our students and all the uh, joy that they brought, as you described? Uh, I think it's an important time for us to communicate with them uh, in a positive way. So this gives us an opportunity to do that. And I want to thank uh, Jimmy Downey for volunteering his time as Santa Claus and Joel Miko for volunteering his time as the Grinch. <laughs> uh, you guys pulled it off in a wonderful fashion. I would thank never you. fit in that Grinch. <laughs> could, uh, could we also send a letter through the chair, um, Dr. Dallas, to the law group? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and possibly one other letter to some, uh, um, uh, what I believe might be a Peabody High student that helped out a little bit in that. Uh, I know the Grinch is watching, and I know some of the Grinch friends are watching. Yeah. So <laughs> we are certainly appreciative of, of the Grinch who watches the school committee meetings. Yes. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, maybe send the Grinch a little letter. Thank you. <laughs> Great stuff. All right, and I say that's unanimous. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right, thank you all. Now we're moving into public participation. And Dr. Vidala, we rely on you. Yep. We so I any? see we have some attendees, and if anyone raises their hand that is an attendee, I know we sometimes have a little bit of a delay. So if anyone raises their hand, uh, we will bring them in. Okay, so I have Mary Henry has raised her hand. So she is coming in. Mary, if you could unmute, state your name and address for the record. I'm sorry, not unmuted. Now I'm unmuted, correct? Correct. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, 
My name is Mary Henry. I live at 15K Avenue in Peabody, and I am the president of the Federation of Teachers. Um, I have a few things to say. Uh, excuse me, just one moment. All right. Uh, moved to open schools under the hybrid model, the Peabody Federation of Teachers made it clear that it was our primary goal to have an opening that would focus on safety first. Safety for our children, for their families, along with staff members and their families. We worked cooperatively with the district and with you, Dr. Vidala, to reach a memorandum of understanding to allow schools to open, at all levels, to open on a hybrid model. Uh, many aspects of that agreement have been very successful. Teachers and paraprofessionals have buckled up and risen to the occasion, learning new methods of instruction and going well uh, above and beyond to meet students' needs, just like the example you gave about teachers bringing computers so remote kids could see a parade. So many other examples of above and beyond things that teachers have done uh, and, and paraprofessionals have done for students. Uh, while it may seem to some that we're doing less instruction, in reality, we're really doing double duty. Um, high school teachers are teaching double the classes every day, and we're making sure that every child on every level has full educational opportunities all day. And uh, we are, really are doing a good job. You know, at the beginning, though, in, in last September, when we came up with this, we were led to believe from the district that the schools would provide remote instruction the minute we hit red um, levels of COVID. That didn't happen. Then we believed that after three weeks of levels of red that we would move to remote instructions, just as other districts have done with lower numbers. Once again, we did not move to it. Even after they changed the method of computing what a red district is, and we moved into high red numbers, ranking 16th in the state for COVID cases, we still remained open while schools around us closed to go remote for short periods of time. We appreciate that Dr. Vadala has listened to our concerns about the safety of our members and that he and I collaboratively worked to allow uh, staff to work remotely on the Wednesdays from November 25th right through December 23rd. Um, and I want to add here that Dr. Vidala has been uh, forthcoming about the numbers and has kept up his end of the MOU on that. And I do appreciate that. And uh, it's, it's hard to keep up with everything, frankly, because there have been so many cases coming in more and more and more. Um, many staff members have reasonable fears about their safety and those of their family member while they still remain at work in person. They are founded based on science and on personal experience. In addition to many positive cases, there have also been many cases of quarantining in the schools, rightfully so, following public health protocols, leading to disruptions among both students and staff. At the high school, there have been multiple days with staff's absences in the high double digits, up to as many as 20 with administration scrambling to cover classes. I'm not blaming administration for this. This is just the reality and a fact that the number of our cases, especially at the high school level, is too high to make often to maintain the schools in a proper safe method. In the past, when members have ra ra uh, raised concerns about spread within the schools, I've always defended the district and agreed that there was no evidence of spread within the schools. I can no longer say that in good faith, particularly at the high school level. There simply are not enough substitutes to cover the classes. And you showed that in the budget tonight, by the way. And the district does not have the means to provide them. People just aren't willing to come into the schools because they know it's not safe. This has created situations where safety has been compromised, when our paraprofessionals and some teachers have been asked to move all over buildings to cover classes, and it is leading to a crisis in confidence as to the safety of our children and 
the adults in the buildings. School administrators who are not trained public health professionals have been assigned the responsibility of doing some of the public health investigating when someone has been diagnosed with a positive case. That's concerning because they might miss things that a public health professional would get. Some people are being encouraged to return to work when they don't feel safe to do so. Others have had uh, to avoid all direct contact with close family members, even their own children and spouses and parents who are at high risk because they don't want to spread the virus within their families. The families of our students have the well-deserved option and privilege to move their child to re remote learning. And that certainly is happening on an increasing level throughout the district. But most teachers and paraprofessionals do not have that option. Some staff who would have qualified to work remotely at the beginning of the school year, but choose to come in under the hybrid model in good faith because they really wanted to be in present with the students, no longer feel safe, especially veteran teachers who tend to be higher risk, but who are some of the greatest skilled teachers in our district. Right now, the positive uh, COVID-19 cases, yes, they're down from a week ago, but they are still much higher than the highest rate they were in April when the state was in a full lockdown. Today, the governor announced that restrictions for businesses like restaurants would be lowered to 25 companies percent capacity, yet schools remain open. Contrary to what has been said here tonight, every day our elementary students are having snack and lunch with masks off. And at the in, ele, uh, middle school, they're having lunch with masks off. De Desi wants us to open, yet Desi isn't open. And its workers are largely working remotely. There are other pe places in this community where workers are in the buildings, but visitors aren't allowed. We are expected to spend full days in the classroom with children at high risk. And we want to do our best for our children. And we believe in the hybrid model as long as it's safe. But we're coming to a point where we know there's been a surge after Thanksgiving. We're about to have the, the Christmas, uh, Kwanzaa, and other holidays, along with New Year's Eve, when people will congregate, especially the older students. It's just a fact that we need to acknowledge. And yes, we're all doing a great job, but it's a pandemic. It's a scientific fact that the disease is airborne and it spreads. And one of the school committee members mentioned three feet, whereas studies have shown that this virus can be spread as far as 20 feet. So three feet is not what the CDC says, and it should not be what our district even thinks of. Now, I wanna be very clear about this. Dr. Vidala and I and the PFT have worked very closely and cooperatively, and we are really trying to work on solutions, and we seriously recognize that there are high needs children that we need to address. I personally am a sibling of a child with high needs, special needs. My sister had Down syndrome, as many of you know, so I know how important it is to have that school experience. However, we're not ready to make any agreements with regard to that without really going through it and talking to our members about we'll make, what will make them feel safe to return. That having been said, nearly every district around us, Beverly, Salem, Danvers, Lynn, Linfield, Marblehead, Saugus, Swampscott, Governor Baker's home time, and Revere are all working remotely from uh, January 4th to the return to return um, on January 11th. This is a plan that our students deserve. So we ask for three things. Number one, all schools in the districts return remotely for January 4th to January 8th. That is one week and it's like every single district surrounding us is doing, except for the high income, high end districts and even some of them are doing this. We have people in our community that work in high risk jobs and bless them for what they do, but they are putting risk through no fault of their own onto our children and members as well. We would like to return and that way, whatever post holiday surges, it'll give it a time to settle down. 
we want to come back very desperately. We want to come back in person. And this is one of the reasons we don't want to do it. We don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish. The second thing that we would like is that all school buildings will be thoroughly cleaned with all surfaces sanitized. This sanitation is supposed to be happening on a daily basis, but the fact of the matter is our hardworking custodians are under, there are not enough of them. There are too many openings and they cannot do everything that they're expected to do. And closing the schools would give them the opportunity to give the thorough cleaning that our buildings really need. <coughs> and then finally, the, the, the is to retest air quality in all buildings, which is in our memorandum of understanding that we would have regular uh, air, air quality tests. We need those, those buildings to be tested while staff and students are in the building. So it's a real life experience, not an empty building experience. And uh, we would like to be present for that testing as well. Um, we really want these simple requests so that we can keep numbers down. Someone mentioned a vaccine. We want more than anything to be able to go back in person to take that vaccine and do what's best for everybody. But right now we don't have that. We need to live with the reality we're in, not the wishes we have. And we need to take care of our children and our staff and by going back to school the week after vacation, we will not be doing that. I don't understand why every other community in the area understands that, but we seem to think that we're Teflon. Our numbers are going up and up and up, and we need to do better by our children, and we do need to do better by our staff. I'm speaking for the PBD Federation of Teachers. My name is Mary Henry, and I am the president. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Our next member to speak is Emily. Emily, if you could please, I'm gonna bring you in as a panelist, please unmute and state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily Jingaleski and I am at 12 Pumping Station Road. I was just wondering, um, I saw in the previous meetings that you had gone to each of the schools and done a thorough report on what's working, what's not working, what the needs are. I'm just wondering if that's going to be also done within the remote academies. Um, you know, I know the middle school has its own remote academy. My elementary school student is um, in a class with two different schools. So just kind of wondering if there's going to be some type of touch point on how it's going with them. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we'll definitely take that uh, to our group. I think that's a great idea. And I know in many of the schools that we were in, uh, we did have remote students that were part of our focus group, but I'll definitely bring that back to the principal. Thank you. And I'm seeing no more hands raised in our public participation. So I'll turn it back to you, Mrs. Dunn. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vidala. All right. Next on the agenda are subcommittee reports. Oh, I'm sorry, written communications. Seeing none. Ms. Dunn? Yes. I believe we did receive an email from um, Patty Nismantowski. Uh, I'd like to receive that as a written communication, and I uh, so move. Second. Right. Motion by Mr. Hoffman, seconded by Mr. Amico. Is there any discussion? Um, I think this it would have to be included in the packet for the record, so maybe um, we, if it's not in our packet publicly, should we include it in the next packet, or how will that procedurally, um, legally be corrected, I guess? Mm -hmm. uh, it would probably be, it could be included in the, in the next agenda as it was arrived late. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, Mr. Hoffman. Well, um, it is a good question, Ms. Carpenter, and it's something that we've done before, I think as recently as uh, when we were dealing with the investigation regarding a student in the middle school and there was a parent that spoke at public participation who had a handwritten letter that I think Ms. Dunn uh, moved to um, receive 
so whatever the normal procedure is that we went through for that is all I'm asking for. Uh, you know, whatever the normal protocols, I'm sure Ms. Maccarelli will be able to uh, identify what that is and uh, comply with it. Did each of, oh, Mr. Miko? I would agree with uh, Mr. Hawkman, especially where it was an email and it was given to us uh, a couple of days ago, I believe, versus something that was handed during the meeting. So I, I would, I, I would agree with his motion. You know what, Mrs. Dunn? I'm sorry to interrupt. Possibly, um, it can be included in the minutes of this meeting, and then we'll we'll approve those minutes at the next school committee meeting. That I think that's actually okay. Is that procedurally what should happen? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're right, Ms. Scott. Yeah. Of course I am. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> I answered my own question. <laughs> the, the the problem with the communication. <laughs> The problem with the communication was that it was submitted too late <laughs> under under our rules to be included in the packet. Um, and it is up to the committee whether they want to receive it or not. And if that is the wish, we will take a roll call vote. And the motion is to receive, uh, I'm sorry, to receive a letter that was emailed to committee members and that is, that will be included with this agenda under and through the minutes yeah. okay so the motion was made by mr hockman and seconded by mr amico roll call vote mr amico yes mr arnotis yes Ms. carpenter yes mr hockman yes and mr Lumpio. yes mm -hmm. okay thank you all right now we go to subcommittee reports education subcommittee mr hoffman uh, i'd like to talk about uh the hybrid learning model no <laughs> 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 no uh, just uh, wishing everyone a nice uh winter recess and hopefully folks can take the time to uh, relax and wind and enjoy some quality time with each other okay thank you uh finding a subcommittee mrs carpenter nothing to report okay school safety committee uh nothing new to report Thank you, Mr. Olympio. Athletics and wellness? Uh, just a question for Dr. Vidala. Uh, I know that we had put forward a um, plan for winter, sport tryouts, winter sports tryouts at the high school. I know that that was impacted by some uh, students who tested positive. Uh, and I just was wondering if there's been a date set for those tryouts. Yes. So the Boys and girls hockey and swimming and diving and gymnastics have all started. Boys and girls basketball is set to start on the 28th as for their tryouts, so December 28th, next Monday. And uh, that was confirmed that they are holding that date and they're going to proceed with that date. So Good to hear that everybody is well. Uh, just as a follow-up, where does that put our off-season sports for conditioning? I believe we're still looking at January 6th, and okay. uh, I'll, I'll bring that back to uh, the athletic director and make sure that that is communicated to everyone. So we're, unless something changes from the tryout date or in between with regard to health issues, January 6th, we can expect to start conditioning for off-season sports. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Okay, thank you. Um, Quality and Standards Subcommittee. Uh, the subcommittee met this evening prior to tonight's school committee meeting. The topic was further discussion about a policy regarding memorials. The members discussed the definition of memorial. We did make a decision that unlike the model uh, policy that we have, that we are going to continue to allow memorials. In the schools, we're going to work on a process so that those memorials will be approved and um, very responsive to the individual school communities. We're going to continue to work on the whole issue that's been presented to us. We're going to have another meeting, hopefully before the uh, January 12th school committee meeting. And at that time, we'll have more definitive information. We may have a policy ready for you at that time. And uh, we are looking into some procedures that we'd like to put in place so that there'll be some clear lines on how memorials will be handled in the schools. So if Mr. Arnotis or Mr. Olympia wants uh -huh. to add anything to that, no, it's fine. Okay. It was a good meeting. We, we do want to hear from further uh, groups, staff, students, members of the public, but we are going 
forward with our work. And Mr. Anotis? Just on that note, Mrs. Dunn, perhaps it's beneficial to let the community know that we're looking to speak with some folks you know, related to that subject going forward. Perhaps we should do some outreach mm -hmm. um, you know, as we head into the new year and we know we're gonna have more meetings on this. Right. Maybe start trying to line up folks um, you know, to join us and, mm -hmm. and, and pride input. Yep, and if members of the public want to contact us, please do so. Our emails and our phone numbers are all public information. And yes, we are, we're hoping to speak with some of the students and um, principals and staff throughout the district. Okay, thanks Mr. Edwards. Thank you. All right, uh, liaison to parent and student advisory boards. Uh, I believe I reported on the parent advisory board meeting at the last meeting, if I'm correct. And the student advisory board, hopefully we'll be able to have the students appearing with us. And um, there is training being, being uh, prepared now by MASC, so our students will be uh, in contact with MASC's uh, team of, of trainers. And it's a great program. And I'm looking forward to it, a lot of students, and they'll have that under their belt by January. Okay. Um, next parent advisory board meeting, we're working on scheduling that uh, because our guest of honor will be Dr. Vidala. So we're working with his schedule. Okay. Uh, building and Grounds Subcommittee, Mr. Sure, Nicole? Ms. Dunn, for, the, uh, for you to the committee, I just wanna thank all the custodians at all the schools for all the snow removal and keeping the building <coughs> safe. I want to uh, thank DPW for the great work that they have done, um, not only um, in and around our schools, but throughout the city. Um, especially here at the Higgins where we've had COVID testing. Uh, they did a fantastic job of just clearing around this area so that um, you know, we can have those uh, COVID testing sites here, right here at the Higgins. And there's a huge group out there. Well, they're probably gone by now, but earlier today. So I just wanna thank anyone who's uh, helped out with the snow removal, because it was a pretty nasty storm. And um, hopefully we won't get any more of this stuff. Let, us, let it go to ski country where it belongs. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Miko. Yes, and they were working, they were working at a deficit because they have been affected by their, their workforce has definitely been affected by COVID. So, we appreciate their work. Special Education Parent Advisory Board. Uh, nothing new to report right now. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Whitfield. Liaison to City Council and Legislative Delegation. Nothing new to report. Aside, I will be reaching out to the council regarding the library discussion. Thank you, Mr. Arnotis. And then, uh, Mr. Hockman, the redistricting ad hoc subcommittee. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dunn. We had an opportunity to have our initial meeting last Tuesday. Uh, it was a lively discussion focused mainly around uh, a mission statement for our uh, subcommittee as well as principals uh, and, we, and, and how to guide those principals in regard to the uh, information that we're going to and data that we're going to look at in order to formulate uh, hopefully multiple plans uh, to present to this committee at some point in the future. Our next meeting uh, is scheduled for January 5, 2021, uh, 6 p.m. here at the Higgins and via uh, Zoom. I was gonna say Skype, I was gonna date myself, uh, Zoom. All right, thanks, Mr. Hoffman. New business, is there anything on the new business? Okay. Um, items for the next agenda will follow through in the normal process and um, before we adjourn hopefully Mayor Betancourt is watching because we're going to go on the record as everyone knows the midterm inaugural this year is probably going to be held remote and that's because of COVID um, we're not going to let the mayor pick our numbers out of the box for our seating <laughs> Just so you know, Teddy. So, <laughs> want to just get that on the record. But um, it's always a very nice ceremony, and, and under the circumstances, it's a shame that it won't be able to be like a regular ceremony. But as with everything right now, things are a bit different. But uh, I know that on behalf of Mayor Betancourt, I uh, want to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas, a Happy, happy New Year. Looking forward to 2021. Wish you all a happy Kwanzaa. Any of the holidays that are coming during the season are just so special for families and we hope you can celebrate them and still stay safe. So thank you all very much.
And now I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Amico. Second. Mr. Hoffman. Thank you all very much.